Today's episode of the Peak and Roll Podcast is once again brought to you by our friends at the Print T-Shirt Shop. Everybody check them out online. It's at prnt.co, www.prnt.co. Uh, check them out on Twitter, guys. It's at prntshop. It's just $10 a month, um, and you'll get to join their T-Shirt of the Month Club. And they've been rolling out brand new T-Shirts ever since uh, Paul George, Carmelo Anthony, and especially Russell Westbrook signed their extension. So beat the rush, everybody, and join the join the club. It's really awesome, really awesome Oklahoma City basketball T-Shirts. Uh, help them out. It'll help us out, help the show out, and we'd greatly appreciate it. But for now, let's start the show and listen to the theme song. Welcome to the Peak and Roll Podcast with Brady Trantham. Viewer discretion advised. Oklahoma. You believe all the shit you read? Audience is now dead. What's up, Thunder fans? Welcome to another edition of the Peak and Roll Podcast. As always, this is Brady Trantham. I am, well, we are, not just I, but we are about a week into training camp for the NBA. Uh, The Thunder are actually going to be playing their first preseason game tomorrow night against the Houston Rockets. That game will be played in Tulsa at the BOK Center, so all the Tulsa Thunder fans get hyped for that one. Um, I'm sure you've all heard by now, Russell Westbrook, Patrick Patterson, and um, Alex Abrinas will not be playing per Billy Donovan earlier today at practice. He said they're all still dealing with some minor injuries that the Thunder aren't really too concerned with moving forward. It's just kind of a precaution just to keep them out of the preseason. They should be ready to go by the end of the preseason or at the very latest early on in the season. But it's almost here, everybody. And yeah, I'm... I'm (laughs) I'm incredibly excited, and we're still a few days in the wake of Russell Westbrook signing his extension uh, for the the five-year extension to kick in after this coming season. Um, Obviously, that was really exciting. I was able to go to his uh, press conference and the blue-white scrimmage up in Edmond yesterday, Um, and other than the screaming of the (laughs) kids in the high school gym, it was it was a pretty fun sight to see uh, Carmelo Anthony, Paul George, Stephen Adams, everybody else ball out um, with the Thunder. But I thought it'd be a good idea to bring on a friend of the show, a noted Russell Westbrook fan, a honorary Oklahoman, Mr. James Hollis, otherwise known as Snotty Dripping on t- um, Twitter. Uh, James, I, I can't. I, I tried to look it up and I couldn't. I couldn't find it on such short notice. But I know you were on that podcast er, um, earlier in the week talking specifically about the Russell Westbrook extension. So I don't really want to make you have to rehash everything you've, you've already said on a podcast before, but um, it, were you were you shocked that it kind of went down the way it did, or was it just kind of like, well, we kind of we probably should have just been listening to him this whole time when he would say things like, this is where I want to be? I wasn't, I wasn't shocked. First of all, let me just say congratulations to you guys. Uh, I know that from last summer when it felt like, you know, sure, he signed that extension, but then, like, he played on it, and then it seemed like, well, if he didn't sign next summer, what's going to happen? And, you know, your second-best player was, like, Victor Oladipo or Steve Adams, and things seemed kind of bleak. And to go from that to where Oklahoma City is right now, that's just incredible. Um, Sam Press, you got to tip your hat to him. Kudos, whatever you want to say. Cause buy him at a beer because he did some work this summer. And then the, the icing on the cake is, you know, getting r- the surprise announcement of Russell Westbrook signing that extension. When very smart people that we all follow and read were so, and this, this is the part like, so adamant. There's no way Westbrook stays. There's no way he signs this extension. He's going to weigh all his options and leave it open until next summer. They're going to see how they do. You know, we heard all that, you know, all summer. And should OKC look at trading him? I was listening to uh, Mike Greenberg uh, um, from Mike and Mike. Yeah. Last summer, last summer he had a big rant about how OKC needs to trade Westbrook. They can't afford to lose him for nothing, and it'd be in their best interest to trade him now. This is last summer, and you, you, I just wonder how the people like that have jobs, right? Because look what Presti did this summer. <laughs> so was I surprised? Um, no, you know what? I'm one of those optimists who always said I think he signs, and I took Westbrook as, as Westbrook just seems like a different kind of cat, and I took him at his word, and he said, you know, hey, this is where I want to be. I just took that that's what it meant this is where he wanted to be and it was weird he wasn't signing it was kind of you know i was, I was just kind of wondering why wouldn't he? he's not changing anything not like them to get more money but 
I mean, he kept saying, you know, and all all uh, John Hamm, all those guys kept saying, like, you know, reports are internally the team seems cautiously optimistic that he's going to eventually sign. So, yeah, I was I was uh, I was, you know, I, I believe in the Brody. So when he kept saying, you know, eventually that he'll sign, I, I, I was surprised. Now, the amount of readiness it takes to wait until Kevin Durant's <laughs> birthday. That is a stroke of absolute genius. And that's why I love Russ Westbrook. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm wondering how much of that was just a simple leak from because you know Woj gets all his, gets all of his information from these players' agents. That's how he's so well connected. Check this the- out, dude. Check this out. So I read that you read. I don't know if you read the article on ESPN about it, but he said, uh, "We were going to wait until Sunday." Yeah, and then exactly. Russ called. Russ called. And said, "You know what? No, let's, let's get it done Friday. Today's the day we gotta get it done." <laughs> you know. I'm, that's that's just bravo. Westbrook. He, he he probably was just kind of chilling around his house, and then his phone vibrated, and it said, "It's Kevin Durant's birthday." <laughs> because I'm pretty sure that there's still contacts on each other's phone, and he's like, "You know what? I'm just going to go ahead and say it today." <laughs> I, I, I I I know we we joke about it, and we don't know if it, we'll never know if it's true or not because you know our Russ is going to play. Like, oh, I didn't even know. But um, I, I like to imagine that he he is that petty, so I'll take it. It makes it makes this game so much more fun to uh, cover if that's the case. That's for sure. Um, going back with all the you know Russell's going to leave. There's no way he's going to sign or stay with Oklahoma City long term. You, you know a, a lot of po- a lot of Thunder podcasts in the last few days have been kind of basically patting their patting themselves on the back, saying like, "Ha, we finally got someone that wants to stay." So piss off national media, and you, you know, I, I understand that. There was a part of me that kind of felt that way as well. But like you said, Russell Westbrook's a different cat. Um, he he's not really a guy that's going to say one thing and then have something else entirely different happen behind the scenes or you know in the future. If he likes something, he'll let you know. If he doesn't like something, he will surely let you know. And that's that's basically all that was kind of leaked from his from his group is that he loves Oklahoma City, he loves playing for the Thunder. Um, but if he if he had any say in the matter, it was just he needed more help. And that's exactly what Sam Presti did. Uh, being able to bring in guys like Paul George and Carmo Anthony, that's that's what you hear on Twitter from fans after a loss, after a really bad loss. Oh, we need to bring in Paul George or oh we need to bring in Carmelo Anthony. Like, okay. Because that happened after every single loss last year or every time some um, Carmelo or Paul would have some kind of soundbite about them being frustrated after a loss with them. I'd always see like pictures of Paul George or Carmelo Anthony being photoshopped into a Thunder jersey, and I'd just roll my eyes saying, guys, that is not going to happen. And now we find ourselves here in early October, and I just saw a scrimmage with Paul George and Carmelo Anthony playing basketball in Thunder jerseys. So it's still a little surreal. Every, it's really well documented the great the great job that Sam Presti did this off season, um, but I I really don't know what it kind of means for the future. I mean Russell Westbrook is here, but something I kind of want to get your thoughts on. Everyone's still chasing the Warriors. That's there's no doubt. I mean even though the Thunder have a really nice big three, there's still the chemistry issue that needs to be worked out. How are they going to gel on the court together, off the court together? That's still a big hurdle that this team has to um, handle. And the same thing with Houston and their new, uh, I guess, big two, uh, Chris Paul and James Harden, and your Boston Celtics, who uh, we're kind of watching on stream right now. Uh, but I'm just wondering, do you think now that Russell Westbrook is set set in stone with the Thunder for the next few years, do you think that this is a team that, you know, those token vets that get bought out of their contracts during the season at the trade deadline, are, is this now a team that those types of veterans that can immediately help a squad – We'll look at and say, you know what? I can ring chase with that team because you can't really join Golden State. So it's just it's either San Antonio, OKC, whoever LeBron James is rolling with, and then or Boston at this point, in my opinion. Um. So it, it, it we've never had a situation where the league where one team was so much better than everybody else, right? Yeah. So this is a unique kind of uh, of league environment where. I mean, you're not really ring chasing because honestly, Golden State's that much better, right? I think now, I, I think everyone would probably agree. Yeah, you know, the Cavs, the, you know, have LeBron James and they added some pieces. You know, Dwayne Wade still has some in the tank. We'll see. Um, and then, like you said, the Thunder made some really big moves, and you know, we're not sure how they're going to fit. You know, there for a year, so we don't know. And then Houston, sure, and the Spurs and Spurs, but I mean, I still feel like Golden State's head and shoulders above everybody. 
Right. So, um, yeah, Houston's the same. And I think uh, uh, the Spurs will always be that team kind of too, right, where maybe a vet can all right, well, I, I can still play, and I'm, I can't really care the loads. I want to go for a vet minimum. But the Thunder have definitely went from a team that was that. You know, last year nobody was messing with the Thunder. I mean, Russ was great. And Gibson gave him a glowing, uh, a glowing recommendation. But, you know, it's true. Guys weren't really just lined up to go to Oklahoma City. But now Russ is there for six years. Uh, Paul uh, Mello was there for two years. There's an infrastructure. And let's hope, you know, Mello might, Mello might I mean, not Mello, Paul George might really say, you know, yeah, we went far in the playoffs and this is a great environment. I'm going to stay here. So, I mean, if that's the case, then sure. Hands down. I mean, I, I, I like them better than Houston right now. You know? Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean you're, you're right. I mean, I, I don't want to go ahead and crown this team and say that they're, the, they're right now the second best team out West, even though that's still quite a <laughs> quite a gap between number two and Golden State. But, right. I mean, I think, it, I think it is safe to say that they're at least in the conversation. And going back to June, basically when the Thunder got bounced in the first round, um, you would have been called a complete homer or crazy if you thought, oh, next year the Thunder are going to be in the conversation for the two seed. So, again, just a pat on the back to Sam Presti and even Clay Bennett, who now has kind of just shedded away that that you know cheat tag that he's had ever since the James Harden trade a few years ago. Um, now they're willing to go all in. And another thing that I've been kind of thinking about in terms of trying to lure free agents to a, a team like Oklahoma City, um, and, and I kind of thought this – in the early years of the franchise when Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook were here, it was a new franchise, and while they've been successful, they were successful solely because they had Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook, and then for a time, James Harden, and then you can throw Serge Bach in the mix until he kind of went off the deep end, in my opinion, in his last two and a half seasons with, with the Thunder, but oh well. Um, but now, you know, the Thunder are going into their 10th year. The Thunder now have Russell Westbrook um, locked in for the next six years. The Thunder, I don't know if you've caught this tweet. I, don't, I, can't, I think it might have been Royce who tweeted out a few days ago. But since basically since the Thunder have been in Oklahoma City, um, they have the second most wins in the NBA next to the San Antonio Spurs. So now that now they actually have a nice history of success, of mm-hmm. development. And now they've had quite a few players kind of roll in, in and out of the, of the organization. And big names, to, you know, big names. Uh, Harden, now Paul George, Carmelo Anthony even. Uh, Victor Oladipo is a good name, um, and they've even been in they've been in talks with the Pau Gasols, the Dwayne Wade um, over the last few weeks. Um, they have this; they now have a little bit of history of success. So I'm wondering if that might play into some potential free agents actually giving Oklahoma City some serious thought. Basically, how a lot of free agents look at San Antonio and say that's like the golden icon of success. Like I can go there and I can succeed. And I'm wondering now that Clay Bennett and ownership are willing to shell out the money and pay into the luxury tax. I'm wondering if that's going to be, you know, not the, the a see, an off season like this is not going to be the norm. But I'm wondering if Sam Heck Presti no. is going to yeah. is if, is going to be able to replicate having being successful and not just being in talks with some names, but actually getting guys to come here. Oh, uh, that's a really good point, and I think I've. So the evolution of Westbrook, we know he was he's an amazing statistical player. We saw him last season with the triple doubles and the aggression and you know, he earned the MVP. Now, I'm wondering if after playing with Durant and they kinda no, they didn't bump heads, they weren't the smoothest of fit sometimes, right? And then he went through this he went through his his, his season last year. How does he change how he approaches playing with other really good players? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um I, I think that's gonna go all along how you said veterans who think about coming to Oklahoma City. I mean, obviously he didn't he didn't trust his guys last year, right? And and a lot of it, you know, was at a lot of that was actually, you know, it it was valid. It, his guys just a lot very one dimensional. A, a lot of that was them not even trusting themselves. I keep pointing to this example, and it's just one example, but it was uh, game two against the Rockets when the Thunder had that double digit lead going into the fourth quarter. Russell Westbrook goes out, and it shrinks down to a nine point lead, and there. Once the Rockets kind of took the a, a one possession lead, there was one moment where Russ took a good shot, one of his few good shots in the final two minutes. Um, he took a good shot, uh, back ironed. Victor Oladipo gets the rebound, he, wide open in front of the free throw line, just wide open to the lane. He could take a shot. He can dribble to the basket. He's athletic enough to do it. 
But instead, he just grabs the ball, grabs the rebound, and immediately looks at Russ and passes him the ball. And it basically just told me nobody on this team has the cojones to take the shot. It's only Russ out there, and that's why he kind of forces himself into some, into some really so, bad shots. I see what you're saying, but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you something else here. It's a, it's chicken or the egg because you're it got right. To the point <laughs> it got to the point where Russ. I, I I saw him try it. We watched him. He he was like early in the game. He moved the ball. Oh, he 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 bide his time, and then sometimes he just kind of then all right. I keep trying to take over. We saw it, but that's not really trusting your guys. You know what I mean? That's tr- that's giving out spoonfuls of trust, but that's not really showing. I don't care, guy. I, I, win or lose with you guys, I'm going to feed you guys these shots. That's not what he was doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, but I'm not going to be a stand. And I, I do, I can say it's it's a two-way street. It was it was not just the teammates missing shots and not making shots. Well, he would compound that by stopping, stopping giving them those shots. And now they really are stressed. Like by the end of the season, the bus was terrified of missing when Russ passed him the ball. We saw that by the end of the season, the bonus was like so stressed when Russ passed him the ball that it was he was a nervous wreck. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm not saying Russ like, yelled at him, but it was there. And you know, Russ reacts. You see like the look on his face when guys miss or they're not making shots. You get you get a little short tempered and you know huff and puff a little bit. So that's not the best. So my point is, it, I that's not gonna be this year. He has two guys he really trusts, but does, is he gonna have more trust than the other guys too? Yeah, and I think that's what's so huge about Paul George. Uh, Something I always kind of thought when Kevin Durant was here, when it was basically just Russell and Kevin running the show, um, they worked well together simply because they were such great talents. But yes, when you watch Kevin Durant with the Warriors, it's really apparent how it worked, but it wasn't very, at times, it wasn't very fluidic. It it was it was as if Russell was just trying to sh- shove you know a square peg through a circle hole at times with Kevin Durant and vice versa. It it was so apparent that they needed a third guy to basically not just take the load off load off their backs here and there, but to kind of be the bridge between how those two players interact on the court and how those two players individually play themselves. And I think that's what's so important about Paul George. I mean, everybody knows he he works really well off the ball. He's willing to play off the ball. And I think when you have two ISO ball dominant guys like Melo and Russell, it's really nice to have that third guy to kind of just bridge the gap between those two personalities. But I, and that's why I think this uh, big three is going to work really well, not just because these are three guys that are, you know, top 15, top 20 players in the world. So they're simply just so damn good at their job, they're going to make it work. But I just think that with Paul George, you've got somebody that can bridge those personalities. I hope so. And I hope that I, I don't want us to take him for granted either, though, because he's. I was watching him play in that, in that scrimmage, dude, and he is just effortless. That's the wor- perfect word for him. We played Tracy McGrady, played effortless. Paul George is a lot like that. He scored like 30, and it, he didn't break a sweat, it seemed like. You know, and like that one play where he, it was almost like an extended post. He caught the he, – he, he put a – you know, he had a small guy on him. He was like 15 feet from the basket, and he kind of posted him up, just caught the ball and turned and casually just flicked it at the rim, and he just drained the shot. And like that's that's going to be really valuable, like you said, because Carlo can be a ball pound on his hands. If Paul George can catch and like you know catch and shoots, catch and go, and he makes things happen like that. Now the key is to keep him happy, right? Because you don't want him to be the Chris Bosh in this situation where he feels like marginalized and has to just get in where he fits in. You don't want that, you know what I mean? That's the key. Um, where you keep Paul George engaged and he feels like not, he doesn't feel like he's the third option. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean that's that's the thing is I don't know who who the Chris Bosh of this big three is going to be, but I mean, do they necessarily need a Chris Bosh? I mean, the thing well, about the thing about Bosh, the thing about Bosh is that he was able to bring a lot more to the table than just his individual play, and it kind of came at the perfect time when the league was kind of shifting to, towards what it is now. I mean, you just keep going back to that finals against against the Thunder when Scott Brooks just refused to not basically keep to not keep uh, Kendrick Perkins on the bench you know Perkins and even Serge Ibaka was was still too young at the time but all they do is just have Bosch play the five and then him stretch the floor and there was nothing the Thunder could do to combat it um I don't I don't necessarily know if this if the this big three needs a Chris Bosch well when I, when I say the Chris Bosch is like Bosch Bosch was very like after the, it was over and I think even while it was happening he says it's tough because I'm used to having the ball a lot more, and so I had to find ways to affect the game. So Bosch swallowed his pride and kind of and, and took a, a big step back offensively as far as 
I'm not going to get the ball and just have to be, be free to operate. That's what Wade and, and, and LeBron does. You see what I'm saying? That's what I yeah. mean by be the botch. Somebody's going to not get a lot of get a lot less shots than they're used to. We know it's not Russell Westbrook. He's the point guard. He's got the ball in his hands. He's going to initiate. Between Melo and Paul George, I mean, and maybe this is the unique situation where they both, you know, end up getting about 14 shots and they're both big three. It was Kevin Love in Cleveland, right? His He really struggled the first season and a half or whatever because he just didn't have, you know, a steady diet of touches that he's used to. So that's what I'm saying about who's going to be the Chris Bosch. Is that going to happen? It, you know, who's going to make that? Because I think Melo's, Melo's a gun. That's not a bad thing. I wonder if Paul, how they're going to keep Paul George engaged. And I, a big thing I was having him run with that unit, right? He should be the one running the second unit, not Melo. Yeah, I agree. I mean, a lot of people have kind of just assumed that Melo would be the guy to run the second unit, mainly because – you know, he comes in with this stigma about him that he ha- he's a volume guy. He has to get his shots. He wants his shots. So, I mean, the the this topic on talk radio the last few weeks has just been, well, you know, you take Melo out first, you know, early in the first quarter, and then you could bring him back in, particularly with the second unit, so he can get his shots. And and I don't necessarily know about that. Um, I really think Paul George is better suited to lead the second unit. But like Paul said a few a few days ago at practice, he, he basically expects Billy Donovan to just at least have at least two of them on the floor at the same time. And, I mean, that's obviously the best thing that you would want. <laughs> you know, you want at least two of these all-stars on the floor at any given time. It's just better for the team. But, I mean, I, I, I don't know. The, the thing about those those big threes that we've been talking about the the heat the heat big three and now the Cleveland big three with um Kyrie and Kevin um Kevin Love is they went those big three started and they had a guy that had a ring I mean that that heat big three had Dwayne Wade who had a ring and this big three had with Cleveland had LeBron James obviously this big three has a, t- a combined total of zero rings and I just don't know what that does. I don't. I don't know if it's going to be easy for somebody to basically keep their ego in check and take a step back in terms of. Well, I, I used to get you know twenty shots a game and twenty five points per game or whatever, and now I've got to take about fourteen or fifteen. But it's for the good of the team, so I'm going to do the, these other things because there's no championship leadership that they're basically joining forces with or walking into. So that's kind of my big worry. But I don't know how much of this is is just me trying to dig so deep into something when it's when the simple answer is right there, and the simple answer would be, like I said, these are three top twenty players. They're just going to make it work. Well, I mean, I'm not saying like I don't think it's a big worry, but it should be in the back of your head because, I mean, that's been Melo's whole career, right? That he he won't. Friends, after that one loss in the playoffs, when he, I got to take that shot in the big spot. He views himself as a top, as he should. He's very. He should be very confident. At his, at his peak, there's not very many players better than him. But I mean, that's you know, it's hard to subjugate your ego when you you know your whole career you've been the guy. The only saving grace I think is you know Melo's thirty two, oh, almost thirty two, whatever. Yeah. Paul George is twenty. You know, um, you know I think uh, Westbrook turns twenty nine soon. These aren't like kids. You know what I mean? That's the big thing for me, and I keep saying this. Uh, Garnett made a point of saying that you know him, Ron, and, and Paul Pierce couldn't have gotten together when they were 23, 24. You know, you're a young player. You're trying to establish everything in the league. It's hard to you know step back then and share the ball the way they had to to be successful in Boston. And uh, you know, so it's it's a good thing, man. I, I think they're at that point, right? Melo's been kind of all his selfish. Paul George said he wanted to go somewhere to win. I feel they're all going to make the necessary adjustments to make this work. Yeah, and even with Russell Westbrook, and I mean, I know, James, I know you've paid close attention to his career since he's been in the league. Um, Mm -hmm. But for those that haven't, as great as he is, he finds finds ways to basically improve on one little facet of his game every single season. He's improved. I mean, last year the easiest thing to look at was just his three-point shooting. His three-point shooting went up, but a lot of that had to do with he had a ton more opportunities to make and miss three point shots. So, I, but I, I mean, here's the thing about the, here's the, here's the thing about that though. Usually, the more shots you take, the more your percentage goes down. Yeah, so for yeah, him, that, that was pretty, that was pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, but, but again, you know, Russell's never going to be. I mean, unless he completely changes his game, which a lot. That's the other topic is you know when you know six years from now when Russell's thirty three, thirty four, and getting paid over north of forty million a year. 
is his body going to be able to handle the way that he plays unless he doesn't pulls a Michael Jordan and just basically changes the way that he plays and to more of a perimeter style game. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I can see that, but from with, when it comes to Russell, I mean, basically anything is possible and that's, you know, that's no insight. That's no inside information at all. That's, you know, if you just watch him, that's, that's just the, the scouting report on him. But Something that I, I'm kind of looking forward to with Russell is how how much did he want help? Because I mean, again, like 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 I said earlier, from the Royce piece going back to early July, you know, he just asked Sam, "I just need help." Well, Russ, how much help do you want? Do you want the kind of help to basically make you look better or to make the team look better? And that's what I'm looking forward to because his rebounding is obviously going to go down. I believe his scoring needs to go down as well. He needs to be a better facilitator. He has that talent, and now he has two guys that he can just trust completely. And then you add Steven Adams to the mix, who's going to have a complete a complete different um, vision of the lane than he had last year, where it was just completely clogged. So you've got three guys on your on your starting five that you know Russell's going to trust. So I really I'm looking forward to see how he just makes his teammates better, and I think that he'll be able to do so. Uh, yeah, so my thing with Russ and people keep – I think Russell Westbrook's a very smart player. He doesn't get credit for that. Uh, he's a very self-aware player. He he sees the stuff that's written. You know, he hears the things that says it. As much as he might deny it, he he knows, right? All these players have guys in their inner circle who kind of track that. All these guys have guys in the inner circle who kind of track that kind of stuff, yeah. and you know, they, 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 there's nothing that's said or, or tweeted about him that that you know by probably doesn't see. Um, so he knows his reputation, probably. He knows what he you know about being selfish. And last year was, you know, I think it was good for the Thunder. He he did. It was a performance. It's like a performance art, basically. Still one forty seven. Um, but I I think he knows now. You know, he played with a guy like Kevin Durant, and he really kind of sub. He had to really kind of suppress his game and try to fit in. He played completely free, and he was able to do what he wanted to. And he knows the strain and the stress it takes. So I think we're going to see a refined, uh, a fine-tuned kind of Russell Westbrook. Like his best year when he played with Kevin, I think was was it Katie's uh, MVP year, but he shot like almost forty-seven. He shot like almost forty-six percent. He he kept the threes kind of down, and he, he had his most efficient season because he had he had you know KD was playing at a high level, and so was he. So I think we'll see. Uh, these these two guys are going to just make the game a little easier for him. Uh, Russ can make reads. He's never going to be Chris Paul, right? He's never going to be Chris Paul, but he can make that reads, and he, he'll find his guys, and guys are going to move. He, he's going to – He's. I think he's, we're going to see the best version of Russell. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I agree with you. Anytime Russell's had, you know, exceptional talent around him in the over the last four or five seasons, once he's kind of reached his prime – he certainly played like the MVP cal- um, caliber talent that he is, um, but like you said, he's not going to be Chris Paul. But he doesn't have to be Chris Paul. I mean, he's an MVP in his own right in the way he plays, and that's not to say that there's going to be plenty of games where Russell Westbrook probably takes five or ten more shots than he probably needed to, and it's just a frustrating night. And the Thunder drop a game that they probably should have won by ten or fifteen, given the talent that they have. I mean, that's going to happen. It's, there's 82 games in, a, in an NBA season. You're going to have some ups and downs. And even Sam Presti and Billy Donovan in their uh, uh, preseason press conferences and media day availability, they've kind of said as much. Like I think Presti said it best. He's like, I can go ahead and write your stories for your for you guys already. There's going to be some moments where we probably don't look our best early on in the year, and with the talent that we have, it's just going to be like, oh, what's what's wrong with the chemistry? What's wrong wrong with the Thunder? But you know, Boston's big three went through that early on. Uh, Miami's did early on. I remember, I think Miami. With in their first game against uh, with the big three of the LeBron James and Chris Bosh and D Wade, I think they played Boston and lost. And Dwayne Wade said it best. He went up to the podium and said, "I'm sorry to everybody that thought we were going to go 82 and 0." And that's basically the the mindset that Thunder fans need to have. Like this team is so much more improved already on paper than it was last year, but this team is nowhere near a, a shoe in for 60 wins at the at least. The the biggest difference is the age we live in. Because while in 2008, when Boston had those issues, and even 2011, social media was, you know, just beginning to kind of pop. Now it's 24 seven. Exactly. Now sports, like Sports Center and Bleacher Report, we, we, you know, any 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 missteps, 
will be tweeted like immediately and it'll be you know on the broadcast within minutes. That's where things are a little different, and it's going to be on OKC to uh, really insulate. Scrutiny is going to be, you know, 20, 30 times than what it was last season. And even when KD and Russ were at their peak, it's going to be more because, you know, this is this is a, a new scenario. So um, that's uh, that's I think the big thing for them is keeping outside influences from the locker room. Yeah, well, you know, I'm glad you pointed that out, James, because I don't know if you've noticed or if you've been living under a rock this offseason, but Kevin Durant's had a very bad PR <laughs> offseason, to say the least. And um I don't know if you noticed, uh, the, the Warriors hired um, a P, um, communications PR guy from Oklahoma City, Michael Ravina. Um, mm-hmm. Really awesome guy, really great at his job. I had a chance to interact with him last season, go into practice, go into some games. Um, but when you when you think, you know, Kevin Durant played with the Thunder for eight years, and all this new kind of how the world sees Kevin Durant now with his with his ghost Twitter accounts, with his writing crap on his shoes about how everybody doubted him when nobody on earth doubted him this last year. Um, all all this bad PR um, moves that he makes with basically talking back to fans that are hating on him on Twitter that end up being 15-year-old kids. Um, it's amazing what the Thunder were able to keep, you know, under wraps uh, when Kevin Durant was here. So, yeah, like when, when those moments happen and a lot of people, a lot of eyeballs are square um, looking at Oklahoma City and thinking, why did you drop this game by 15 to the Suns? And, you know, Russell Westbrook was screaming at Carmelo Anthony, so, oh, what's going to happen? I'm pretty confident that the Thunder will be able to keep a lot of things under wraps and in-house. So... Um, and I'm gonna I might ramble a little bit, so if I get to somebody, shut. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> so um, we're seeing a side of Kevin Durant we haven't seen some good, some bad. We've seen some personality. And, you know, I, I guess the Thunder uh, PR team is notoriously very uh, closed mouth. Am I, am I right there? Oh yeah. You know, they're very close to the vest. They're very yeah. You know, they they, they control what comes out of that locker room. Um. I don't know if that's necessarily a great thing, right? Because I think as we're seeing in Golden State, they want their guys to be loose and be themselves. And like, I think that makes for maybe a little better locker room. Well, really quick before you go any further, I think the reason for that, and I've always thought this because I mean, local media here get a little, get a little annoyed because, you know, in every market, you know, players from teams will do like a weekly radio show or they'll do something on TV every week. Um, basically, mm-hmm. they'll have a lot more access with the players. Here, you're you're incredibly lucky to even get to talk to them after practice, it, it seems like it sometimes. Um, and that's not to say that the um, PR guys with the Thunder aren't aren't awesome at their job. I mean, these these guys are really great with us. Oh, for and, sure. And they're, yeah, and this, yeah, that's yeah. what they're told to do. This is, this yeah, is what they're doing their job. It, I get it. It's their job, and they understand how it gets frustrating for us sometimes, so they at least understand. But I think I think that the reasoning for that is, and you hear it you hear it kind of indirectly. You've heard it indirectly from Paul George and Carmelo Anthony when they say things like, I'm glad that I finally only have to care about basketball. I think the Thunder really understand where they live, where they play, what their fan base is, what their market size is, and I think they want to just basically build a bubble around you know the the practice facility and the Chesapeake Arena and say this is all you care about, this is what you play for, this is you're not playing for the small Oklahoma City skyline compared to the huge Dallas skyline or the huge New New York City skyline. This is all that matters. So I think that's the reasoning for it. And but at the same time, I think yeah, I agree with you. Some players that want to have some personality, that want to go on a Bill Simmons podcast every week when something bad happens, they need to have some positive PR to prove a point. Yeah, I mean, a guy like Kevin Durant, he's probably not. He's probably going to get, I guess, rubbed the wrong way after a few years of going through something like that. And I think uh, uh, the other part of my rant was like with Kevin Durant. We, we he said this right. He said this about Russell, Russell Westbrook. How he's kind of envious of how Russ, you know, Russ was had his fiance, and Russ knew exactly who he was while Kevin was still trying to figure himself out. And I, you know, Kevin Durant has a lot of insecurities. Um, you know, basketball was his only friend growing up. He says, and how you know he grew up. He grew up pretty poor, and you know he has his, his insecurities. Like you know. The, he talks about it. You know, I'm not I'm not picking on him. He has his, he has a lot of insecurities and and 
he like you know the guy's 28 29 still trying to find himself which is not bad at all but we see the the stark difference between him and westbrook and um like even the thunder i think they changed a little bit because like now that the the fest the rust fest they are being a little more outgoing right and i think yeah. the, maybe the the thunder social media is now a little a little more fun that's what i'm saying like i think maybe they learned from okay maybe we were a little too restrictive and now we're loosening up and i think like this I'm not, it's not that's not why kevin durant's doing what he's doing now it's just the fact that he's a different kind of guy and like he's obviously has his insecurities and like, that's why i think russ might be the perfect star for oklahoma city russ is straight up 100 percent who he says he is yeah. You know what I mean? And that's really that's really cool. That's really cool for the Thunder. It's really cool for the fan base. And um it's gonna like I think Paul George just had a comment in a in a recent uh, interview where he says this is and this is kinda wild to me that he says this. He kinda needs another star to feed off of and set the tone. And like that's why Lance Stevenson was kinda good for him, you know, the intensity. So playing with Russ, we might see Paul George like hit another level. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, I mean, that's kind of what I've been thinking about, and <laughs> I'm not trying to say Lance Stevenson was a star. He was a very good player for what the Pacers needed at the time when they were mm-hmm. in those back-to-back Eastern Conference Finals with the Heat. But it's the, it's that similar intensity that he brings to the table that Russell Westbrook brings to the table. So you're exactly right. That's going to be that's something that I don't think anyone's really talked about or harped about that I've heard is like, how is Russell Westbrook going to make Paul George better? Well, look at this example with Lance Stevenson. Um, and I guess this, this will kind of go into some indirect um, questions what we'll get to in a few minutes. But um, do you th- is this the best team that Paul George has played on on paper and even Carmelo Anthony? I mean, what do you oh, think? Oh, hands down. Yeah, hands down. Now, uh, that team that Melo had that went to the West Conference Finals, AI was still like only 30 or 31. And Camby was at the height of his defensive powers. Um, and, you know, Nene was still young and very spry. Like that – uh, top to bottom, maybe might be more talent. Those those Nuggets teams are really good, but um, I think just overall, as far as maybe you know, with with a, a full like I guess potential ceiling, yeah, Russ is definitely like you know this version of Russ is better than that Iverson by far, and then you know uh, Paul George is better than anybody. I'm think I guess Amari was you know really good for a hot minute in New York. But, you know, that was just him and Amari and, and him and uh, Melo. So I would say, yeah, this for both of them should be. I know neither one of them has played with a player as good as West, Russell Westbrook right now. See, you know, a lot of New York fans, which I'm assuming only maybe one or two desperate for basketball nerds listen to this podcast. But, you know, probably those two guys are going just going, uh, he played with Chris Dats Porzingis. <laughs> uh, he's, and we, he's not there yet. He's right. Not, we love I love Chris Dats and what he's going to be. But uh, yeah, in a couple years, you, you could yeah, in a couple years, and even then, he's not going to be what you know. I mean, the guy was the freaking MVP. You know what I mean? Russ is the MVP for a reason. So this is going to be a lot of fun, man. And you know what? Another thing. Um, this has been a real long ramble. I was talking about how you know, you no, know, how KD played in OKC, right? And he was he was amazing. Won the MVP. I I sometimes think KD and Russ's games were too big to coexist. As in both this need, they you know they fill up so much of the court and they they do both need the ball so much in such different ways. I Paul George is almost the perfect step down from Kevin Durant that you would want to pair with Russell Westbrook. You see what I'm saying? Like because he's Russ is clearly better than Paul George, but Paul George is still good enough and still plays that kind of style enough as a you know playoff ball that he'll be I think a better fit with Russell Westbrook even though he's not a better player than obviously KD he's a better fit and then you add Melo into that equation as that third guy who could just you know score at will that's going to be this might be the one of the best OKC teams we've seen yeah definitely and I think a lot of people thought this cuz I I sure as hell did the day Kevin Durant ended up signing with the Warriors you know, it was just, man, if the Thunder could somehow get Paul George, that would just be the most, the perfect fit for this team, for Russell Westbrook, because like you said, he he brings a lot to the table that Kev Durant brings to the table. He's able to space the floor, he can put the ball on the floor, um, he's probably a better perimeter defender, um, you know, straight up than Kevin Durant, even though Kevin Durant has exceptional length, and that kind of plays into his defensive capability. But yes, like you said, it, it's just, just a step down from Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant's a freak generational talent. I mean, he's a, he's a seven footer that can shoot from you know thirty feet with ease and give you twenty thirty points in a blink of an eye, but yeah, Paul George is just a step down enough that his 
just the 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 aura that surrounds his game can coexist, I think, a little bit better and a little bit smoother. Going back to that fluidity that fluidity between Russ's and Kevin Durant's game that we talked about earlier, I think it fits better. And yeah, a 32 year old Carmelo Anthony um, as your third option, second option, or even your first option on some nights, he still has that talent. But a 32 32 year old Carmelo Anthony um, as the third option. It's perfect, I believe. And now, if this was 26, 27-year-old Carmelo Anthony, I, I don't think it would work as well. Absolutely. And it, like we just talked about, like young players, you know, especially... We 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 just mentioned so casually how players should come off the bench. But, like, Melo was like, you know, he was shocked and, like, almost probably a little offended by somebody saying that. You know what I mean? People so casually say stuff like, "Oh yeah, Demar Derozan would be some of the some of the stat guys. Demar Derozan would be better served off the bench. The guy just doesn't point the game and is an All Star All NBA player. He would he would probably like crap a brick if somebody said that to him. You know what I mean? <laughs> Which kudos so it, kudos to Eric Horn from the Oklahoma for asking that question. I mean, I, I get why he asked it. I mean, it, it was out there, but he he got it off. He got it addressed, and that's off the table. You know, from day one at least. <laughs> was that my guy, Eric? I didn't realize. Yeah, that was him. But um, I mean, it's you know, it's a valid question. I just know again, but the the response from Melo was one hundred percent authentic. You know, and he was like, "Me? You know, <laughs> I, I scored twenty two points a game last year, and I, I'm a career like twenty five points off the bench. I'm still, you know, I'm still a viable option. What are you talking about? So, I think people don't really starting is a bo- is a badge of pride for uh, NBA like high level NBA players. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. So. Yeah, but still, uh, so I, I still have a little concern about how Melo will will accept, you know, that tertiary kind of role. But I mean, hell, him, PG, and Russell get all the shots they want in that offense. So, yeah, and I think a lot of people are just kind of glossing over the fact that Paul, um, that Carmelo Anthony, excuse me, Carmelo Anthony is just, yeah, I'm going to play the four, and he's had a great attitude about it. Um, I think playing the four with the Thunder is much different than playing the four in the triangle with the Knicks, especially with the talent the Knicks had. Um, and I know it was just a scrimmage, but it was the first time that we were all able to see, you know, those two guys, at least, you know, Russell wasn't able to play yet, but we got to see those two guys interact on the floor with one another. Um, I really appreciated Melo's intensity on defense. He was barking, um, sets, you know, as soon as they got set up in the um, half court, he had, he put in a lot of effort, a lot of energy, um, off offensively. He was moving the ball when he got the ball in his spots, he took the shot and that's what you want. Uh, I mean, Carmelo Anthony taking, you know, the Thunder having an, a half court offense and then passing the ball to Melo, and he shoots it. That's not a bad play, but people are always going to point to that as, oh, that's that's Melo getting doing his jab step thing and just taking volume shots. It's like, no, if he's in his spot, you want him to take his shot. He's that type of guy. Um, it's silly to just say, oh, pass the ball, Melo, get the ball, pass it to somebody else, so it looks like a Spurs offense, and because that's what Twitter, um, NBA Twitter loves, but. Ah, uh, they sick. They, I hate them so much sometimes, dude. <laughs> Look at this I play that hate. takes twenty four seconds to go to just uh, unnecessary pass, unnecessary pass, and then a layup. Okay, okay. Guess <laughs> what, guys? Guess what? You know why Demar Derozan's taking that shot? It's because he's paying the fifty one million dollars to take that shot. He's paid <laughs> to score those twenty seven points. He is not paid to be freaking, uh, you know, to be Joe Johnson facilitating. He's not. It's okay, guys. It's it's not bad. Oh, they they just irk. So bad sometimes. There are so many ways to play basketball. Not not one. There are so many ways that you can play basketball. It's a sport. It can be Thank interpreted you. in other ways. <laughs> yeah. I, well, their problem is their problem is that they love you know, they fall in love with that efficiency thing. And if it, if it's not the most efficient way, you should always strive for efficiency. Somebody told me that. I said no. Guess what? Some of these players, that's just not what they do, dude. How many rings does okay. Chris Paul has? Exactly. And they all <laughs> they love his. Oh, don't get me started, dude. Don't get me started. All right. Well, um, James, let's let's uh, we've been talking for a little bit now. Let's get. Hold on, hold on. Oh, what's up? So we didn't discuss the uh, we didn't discuss the the scrimmage. Oh yeah, I've been so all, busy. I guess it just I just kind of went. No, yeah. it's all right. Well, cause all I really wanted to say is that it was absolutely incredible seeing how good Paul George and, Car- and Carmelo Anthony were. That's all I really want to say about it. Yeah. It again, like. This this surreal has been said a zillion times over the last few weeks. When you know you can you consider Carmelo Anthony's been added to a team with Paul George and Russell Westbrook, and they happen to play in Oklahoma City. It's it's incredibly 
odd. And when I was at Media Day and I was watching Carmelo Anthony walk around the halls in a Thunder jersey, I, I really couldn't believe what I was seeing. And the I can't I don't know two or three times that we've uh, been able to talk to Carmelo, it's been really eye opening how candid he is, how intelligent he is. I mean, I mean, I followed Carmelo Carmelo's career since he's been in the league, um, and kind of going back to uh, the NCAA tournament run, and we even got to ask him about that because he is now a teammate of Nick Collison, who he defeated for the national championship back in 2003. Um, you know, I've followed him in his whole career, but I, I got to admit, I've kind of fallen prey to the, just the stigma that's kind of followed him around with the New York media and just him being a cancer, a locker room cancer. You know, n- not necessarily that blatant, but there's always been rumblings about how he's just not necessarily a team player. He's just out there to get hit, basically just get right. hit. Right, he's, hey, he's mellow selfish, mellow he doesn't care about he always cares about stats. Yeah, those people say stuff about Melo. Yeah. yeah, and you know, like I, I, I was fortunate enough to be on um, the one hundred seven point seven the franchise earlier um, in the week, and I kind of said this. Um, you know, when, when you find yourself, even if you're a great player, when you find yourself on some average to bad teams, you're going to you're going to pick up on that culture. You're going to pick up on some bad tendencies and. You know, I, I can. I certainly don't blame Melo for just you know, like. Well, I mean, we don't really have a lot of potential on this team. I don't have that much help. Ownership is a mess. Management is a mess. I'm just going to get my 25 to 30 points a night because that's what I'm paid to do. But in that same breath, once you find yourself on a team that's that has great ownership, that has great management, and then it has great talent around you, and you have cha- championship aspirations, you're going to be a better player. And because Melo is so intelligent, because Melo is so candid in how he, you know, speaks to us, how he interacts with his teammates on the floor that we got to see in the scrimmage, I'm completely confident we're going to see a much different Melo than what people are probably kind of just used to. And he kind of said it at media day himself when uh, I think it was also Eric that asked him, you know, like, or excuse me, it was Barry Trammell, the Oklahoma. And he asked him, you know, you've always been a guy that people assumed you wouldn't want to play in Oklahoma City. He kind of cut Barry off and said, well, that's because people don't know me. And that's exactly right. I don't Mm -hmm. think a lot of people really know Carmelo Anthony because he's been stuck in that hellhole that is the New York Knicks for the last few years. And I also think that for most of his career, we we have unfair expectations that we've we've like foisted on Melo and he's been kind of miscast. By him, you know, the same kind of the same size, you know, or similar build as LeBron and uh, you know, he was billed as that. Oh, it's gonna be the new, the new school. Uh, you know, bird and magic, whatever. So we kind of put him as on that kind of plane, and then we were disappointed when he wasn't that player. Well, it's because he's not that kind of player. Melo is more, I think. Uh, I don't know, like a Bernard King, or he's a scorer. That's it. I mean, in a, in a phone booth, win or lose, he can give you twenty five, twenty six. A lot like Kyrie, he is a weapon. He's not the he's not the soldier. He's the weapon. LeBron James is the soldier in in uh, Cleveland, and then Car- Kyrie was that weapon. They, they you know they can they could deploy and he'll give them you know big buckets, whatever. That should have been Melo. He should have been playing with a better player than him all this time. Instead, he was the face of franchises, and he's just not built like that. That was my thing. He just didn't have the full skill set for that. And so now we're going to see, like you just said, we're going to see a completely different Melo. I don't think he was. Uh, I don't even think like the culture hit him. I think he was just doing what he does. That's it, that's he's a basketball player that scores a lot and you know we wanted more from you know oh he needs to be a better facilitator he but well guess what that's just not who he is and you know for i think once you once you think of it that way you can view carmelo in a completely different way yeah i hope i hope people just kind of go into this um both local national media local national fans they kind of go into this with a different mindset than what they have been now i say that i know damn well game one against the knicks if uh um, the Thunder aren't playing too well, and Melo's like taking some bad shots. It's just they're just gonna let him have it. They're gonna let the Thunder have it. Um, that's it's just the way it goes. Um, real quick, did you? Uh, how good was your sh- um, stream feed of the scrimmage? Because I ca- I saw a bunch of people on Twitter complaining how terrible it was. Mine was awesome. I was okay. streaming it from yeah, I was streaming it from like the NBA site, I think, or whatever site. Like I think News OK had News OKC or whatever had a site too. I, I had a good stream. Good. I guess I don't know if you could tell or if you could hear. Um, my ears are still ringing from because I mean the, the only people that got to go into that scrimmage were students from Edmund North High School, and they were screaming the they whole were, time. It wasn't cheering; it was screaming <laughs> in a very small high school gym, and it was it kind of made it really hard to concentrate. But you know, like you said, it was really awesome to see Paul George and Carmelo Anthony just work the floor together. Um, that one play that I was able to capture, um, 
that where Paul George just destroyed Josh Eustis and crossed him up and then had a bounce, a sweet bounce pass to Steven Adams. I mean, I'm expecting a lot of that. I, mean, I think, you know, we've talked this whole show about the big three. I think Steven Adams is going to be the guy that benefits the most. And we saw that in the scrimmage where Adams had a lot of room to work. And he's one of the better screeners. He's incredi- incredibly physical, incredibly strong all on all spots on the floor. I think he's going to be the guy that benefits the most. Yeah. You you must have read my write up of the trade. Oh I, yeah, the mellow. <laughs> yeah, where I think um, we have a now after in Russ when no oh, Paul uh, Stephen Adams will have a breakout year next year. We he had an un, underwhelming next season, right? It was underwhelming because, like you said, after the first few maybe first couple weeks when you know they they kind of the other teams had the scouting report. Yeah, when they ran pick and roll with him and Russ, they just, you know, they just sloughed another guy down to the lane. He had a guy sitting in his lap, when he, and there was just no room for him to elevate and catch lobs. And they just kind of crowded him and made light, you know, made, made, he just had no space to operate. And um, yeah, now you put Paul George and Melo out there and maybe, you know, Abrines or whoever else. Doesn't matter whoever else. Paul, just Paul George and Melo out there with, with Adams and Russ. And he should see, like, you know, wide open interstate lanes to run. And to attack the glass and, you know, just make himself available like he's he's really good just kind of hanging around the rim and finding pockets of space. And guys, when they drive, you know, and, and they, the defense collapses on them, they'll just you know, hey, there's that right there, two feet from the bucket, you know, big dunk, big dunk. So, yeah, it's going to be fun, dude. Yeah. And even even Melo and Paul seem to really respect Steven's game and athleticism because there were, um, I think, two or three times where they get a quick rebound and Adams was halfway down the floor and Melo and Paul, e- either one of them would have the ball. And the first thing they would look to was Adams and. I think two or three times they threw it to him, and one time he had a dunk, and the other two times he got fouled. So there's going to be a lot of those opportunities. And Adams is, you know, for as physical and as bulky as he is, a lot of people forget how well he runs the floor for as big as he is and how athletic he is. He's the perfect fit for a kind of a – he's not – he's by no means a stretch center, and that's what a lot of NBA teams want nowadays. But he's as close to a bridge between a stretch center in terms of being able to – really run the floor and a conventional center that can, you know, bully you in the paint offensively and defensively. So it's going to be a great fit. And I'm incredibly excited to be able to cover this team and see how, how well it works basically. But um, I guess James, if, if you're ready, you want to get into some questions because we got quite a few from what I can tell. Yeah. All right. Yeah, man, let's do it. Awesome. Um, thunderous obstinacy, obstinacy. I can't read. Um, we actually kind of, went through your question. So thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. We both kind of agree that Melo and PG, this is the best team they've played on. Um, so yeah, we'll go to the next one. All right. Chiefs three and O thunder. Oh, Oh, at can't read it at Harper Dawson. Thank you. Which the chiefs are, are they winning right now? I don't watch football. Yeah. I, I was about to say, I probably asking the wrong person. <laughs> no, they're okay. They're losing 10 to seven. Anyway, Harper asks, what if any trade do you see the Thunder making before the deadline? Um, this is a team, mm. this is a team, and this is a GM that is constantly looking for ways to make this team better. So while this team on paper looks pretty damn set, I am by no means expecting a quiet trade deadline day. I think there's a massive hole behind Steven Adams. I mean, you lose in his canter off the bench. So your next option at the center position is Dakari Johnson for as talented as he is. He's still got quite a few years to go. Um, he's a he's an old school center. He doesn't stretch the floor by any means. Um, he's a banger. He's so slow. He, yeah, he's he's not the most athletic um, big that um, in in the league by any means. Um, I think that that's probably the most glaring position of need is the Thunder desperately need a, a backup center that, that Billy Donovan can rely on. So Adams is able to take a blow here and there. Um, and I know there's going to be a lot of people that are going to want some outside shooting off the bench, but I'm confident. I'm confident that Alex Abrinas can take that next step. Yeah, but you can always you, you can never have enough shooting. Yeah, exactly. That, that's my thing. You can never have enough shooting, so they're going to look for shooting uh, trades. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, I know we're going to see a lot of. I think Jeremy Grant's going to man from center too, right? And Pat Pat's going to play center. So I don't know, man. If you're if you're talking about you need another center, it's gonna be uh, like you said. You were talking about how Stephen Adams is kind of that bridge. 
Yeah. He is there's two kind of centers. There's like the Miles Turner, you know, the the unicorn shoot, springy, whatever. And then there's the old school or it's kind of old school, but rebound, block shot to run the floor. Steve Adams to me is like a deluxe version of Deadman, because that's all he's gonna do. And he's not as fast or as athletic as Deadman, but he's gonna, you know, he, and he's a stronger defender, I think, in 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 the post. Um I just don't uh yeah, they gotta find a backup big and, and I don't know who it's gonna be. I don't know how they're gonna like real quick in my head who's gonna somebody actually made the mention to me of uh this is a hot take. They said they're gonna trade Steven Adams for uh DeAndre Jordan to be absolutely incredible, I think. It's not I don't think that's a really an upgrade. I love Steven Adams there. And I think DeAndre Jordan's a little bit overrated. But as far as for how these guys are gonna play, just you know, high pick and roll with Russ and or Paul Jewel, that would be pretty cool. You'd have to, if, if that were the case, you'd have two guys that you could hack a shack with. You'd have Andre Robertson on the floor and DeAndre Jordan. I, I don't know I about know. that. <laughs> like I said, I, I don't think it's an upgrade. I think that Steven Adams is that good where and so young where he's going to get better. It's not really an upgrade, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, so I, I got nothing for the trade, man. I, I'll just go with whatever you say. Yeah, uh, it's kind of hard to forecast trades because – I mean, the only trades that people care about are big names. I mean, before all the Paul George, Carmelo Anthony business happened, I mean, the only big name that really made sense if you thought about it was maybe Kevin Love, basically because Cleveland was trying to shell him out. And you have that rapport with him and Russ playing on UCLA together. Uh, But right now, I don't. If there's a trade, it's going to be a mid level type player, mid level type name at best. But again,. You, you doubt Sam Presti, and he'll do something completely different and make you look like a fool. So, Yeah, man. I can't put anything by him, dude. It's like this offseason has been insane. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, and honestly, I like Ray Felton, but maybe a backup point guard. Yeah. Um, you know, I like what Ray, Ray brings to the table in terms of, you know, his defense. Just and not necessarily because he's a great defender. But I don't, I'm not trying to say that. But he's at least a willing dog of a defender. I mean, he's pesky. Yeah, yeah you, you saw it in the scr- you saw it in the scrimmage. He he picked up half court like half the time, and it's just it's kind of a breath of fresh air to see somebody that's just willing like, no, I'm gonna go up there and make your life a living hell on offense. It's an it's yeah. a it's, it's, it's an upgrade from Samaj Kristen because I mean, God love him. He he's just he's just not in my opinion. He's just not ready for to take to basically have that big of a role as the backup point guard on a team on on this type of team. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I guess the only thing I can think of, like you said, it's a big man and more shooting. And it's weird because Samaj still got big, he got a lot of minutes in the scrimmage, and they, they seem like they love him for whatever reason. So, he, all right. He, he's, he's developed pretty well, I'll say that. I mean, I loved him out of Xavier. Xavier's a good basketball program. They put out some good talent, and he's developed really well. Um, it's just, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I see him still on the team, so for what for whatever that means, I don't know. But for the next question, let's see. All right, Kerry from or at Dream the Day Away asks, if we did happen to get by Golden State, how well do we match up against Cleveland? Wow, that's a complete disservice to your uh, Boston Celtics right now. Yeah, yeah, whatever, that's, and that's going to happen. I mean, I understand. Four, the Celtics have four holdovers from last year and a lot of youth, so I hear that a lot. I hear everybody just basically already you know stamping Cleveland's ticket. So we'll see. Um, how much up? Uh, you got Roberson, Paul George to throw at LeBron. I guess Paul George. I think Paul, uh, Roberson's a little too small, but he's gonna try. Even Melo, you try at times. Um, and Pat Pack, you can try on, on Bron. So you got a lot of bodies, a lot of length. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I guess that's it pretty well, right? I mean, I, I don't. I'm not putting too much stock in Derrick Rose. And and Wade is going to help some. I'm not sure how much. So yeah, I think they match up pretty well. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. I mean, you take Melo off this. I mean, basically before the Melo trade went down, I mean a lot of people just kind of said on paper the Thunder have the best team to defend Golden State. You know, just by just on paper, you know, with their mm-hmm. length, their athleticism, the amount of buys that they can, they can throw to Kevin Durant, amount of buys that can throw. Um, I mean, like you said, at LeBron James, they have they have pieces to make things interesting, and it's. I mean, I'm always a little I'm always a little hesitant to say, oh, this team is better than LeBron James. I mean, LeBron James is he's the best player in the world. He makes everybody around him better, and while, like you said, Dwayne Wade has a little bit left in the tank, 
I think just them on the court together, I think we're going to see a 10 times better version of Dwayne Wade than we saw, you know, with the Chicago experiment, um, a much better D Wade than his last year with the heat. Um, I don't know how so, long uh, that's sustainable. So here's my question. Why, why do you say that? Why is it going to be, it's been, it's been what, two or three, three years, four years since the heat. Why would you think we're going to see a better version of him? Well, just, just like I said with, um, you know, the, the mellow factor of him playing on a bad team and he kind of picks up some bad tendencies here and there, but you play on a good team, you're going to pick up better tendencies. It's it's basically just the environment that you're playing around. It brings out the best in you. You have a little bit more to play for. And this is all really, you can't you can't make a statistic on this, I know, and it's a little, a little too philosophical, but I think just Wade playing with his buddy and LeBron James, he's going to play, he's going to play much better. He has a lot to play for now. He's not at a dumpster fire like the Bulls were last year. Um, he probably kind of sees this as his last big hurrah, especially for, for a championship. Um, he's going to have a lesser role in terms of he's probably not going to play that many minutes, even though he's going to start. I think Cleveland's going to be smart with his minutes. Um, and they damn well better be because he can't play, you know, 30 something minutes a night and then expect him to make an impact in the, in the postseason at his age. But I, I'm just, Maybe that's just me being a Dwayne Wade fan from when I was a kid. I I, I want to see one more great year with Dwayne Wade, basically. Maybe that's just me wishing. Uh, I mean, maybe you're right. I just, you know, hey, Father Time is undefeated. I just think he's, I mean, he's just not the same player he was three years ago. And even his last year with, with Braun, you saw the signs already. And, you know, we're three years later, dude. It's like, I don't know. I, for sake, uh, and for, for the league's sake, because uh, the better players we have, the better it is. I hope you're right. I just, you know, I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, you're probably, I mean, again, you're probably you're probably right. I'm an admitted Dwayne Wade fan, so who knows? I'll be excited to watch it either way. Um, let's go through two more questions. So I'll try and skip around and get something cool. Hold uh, on. What, hold on. What, hold on. What's that last question? Did we even answer that question? What how well question? How well do they match up with Cleveland? Oh, okay. So yeah. let me think. Um so let's Paul George, Braun, and then yeah, you could throw uh you know Robertson can guard Wade pretty well. We know Robertson's an incredible defender. To me, Paul George and Robertson have the potential to be the best defensive duo, like a perimeter duo, like almost you know what I mean? I could I guess Clay and K D if you want to say that. And I I don't know, Paul George and Robertson might be better than that. Um, you know, Danny Green and Kawhi. Uh, then Steven Adams is it's great to match up with Tristan Thompson or you know he can't guard Kevin Love but he can you know any he he provides bulk inside. I think Patrick Patterson should be able to kind of deal with Kevin Love on the perimeter or inside. We know Kevin Love is it's funny he's 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 a big strong guy but we saw you know Kevin Love stone him in the post and he's not a I don't know it's weird he's, he's um, not overtly physical overtly physical that's a good answer and then the problem would be a hey, rose and uh and isaiah if Isaiah when Isaiah comes back you know i hope he comes back healthy neither one can contend with russell westbrook and he's going to just you know just dominate his matchup physically i think even though i know rose is kind of close when he's on you know he's still quick and he can still get the hole a little bit I, I i think you know russ russ at the peak of his power is just too much i, I remember watching the nixon uh the nixon and Thunder play last year, and Westbrook was just a one man wrecking crew. So yeah, Rose is good for about a quarter of you know, kind of giving you a, some memories of the player that he used to be, at least from the outside. Um, if if his shots kind of falling, um, mm-hmm. yeah, something that I've been kind of thinking about recently is because of the talent the Thunder have in their defensive vers- versatility. When they do play Golden State, I think we're going to see a lot more Russ on Steph Curry defensively. Because I mean, you're going to put Dre on Clay. You're going to have Paul George on Kevin Durant. You're going to have Stephen Adams, you know, basically patrolling the paint, or Patrick Patterson playing the five. Probably a lot more Patrick Patterson playing the five. Um, where does that kind of put Russ? And we we've never. I, oh, go ahead. Uh, no, I, I was going to. I kind of worry about Russ on on Steph because Steph is a master of using feints and fakes and back screen to get himself open. And I, look, I love Russ Death. And I know when he one-on-one locked in, he can, you know, can can be a, a strong defender for a possession or two. But I know off ball, he gets he gets lost. He turns his head too much and gets... gets yeah. You know, yeah, Steph is such so, an incredibly hard player to defend, not because he's got incredible handles, not because he's incredibly fast or um, incredibly strong. It's just he's incredibly smart and knows how to use the space 
on the floor, yep. knows how to basically pivot his foot, stop on a dime, catch a ball, and turn, you know, basically being defended really well to being wide the hell open. That's why he's so yep. damn hard. And, you know, I don't know if Russell's that type of player that can lock in defensively and defend at that level. But I think we're going to see a little bit more of a Russell Westbrook that's willing to be physical and bully Steph Curry when he's off the ball. But I, yeah, I, mean, but, I, I don't I don't know how much. I'm just interested just because there's much more star power on this Thunder team that it's kind of the Thunder can afford to basically just switch and be happy with whatever lineup or whatever matchup they get. I'd almost say it's probably better if you stick Russ on Clay. But we know how Clay operates off ball. And, you know, my thing with this, I want to see if Russ can work on this. He plays good defense for the first 10 seconds of a possession. He's locked in. He's engaged with his man, hands on him. You know, man, man, you ball. And then you can watch Russ slowly start to stand up. And you can watch the guy get more separation away from him as he moves. And Russ just starts as the shot clock winds down. And then finally at the end of the play, Russ is standing straight up and just kind of. It's the weirdest thing. So. I know he put he extended a lot of energy last year offensively, so let's see if that changes this year. And and you know Russ understands that he has. Offensively. I mean, you're right. It's it's gonna have to happen if you're gonna beat Golden State. You've gotta you've gotta do things that are not necessarily the norm. You've gotta go above and beyond, and you know all the other cliches. You gotta do that to beat a team like Golden State. Yes, um, sir. All right, let's go through. T- let's go through one more question. Um, let me see if I can find a good one. Um. Now Tweet Deck doesn't want to be helpful. Oh, thanks a lot, Tweet Deck. <laughs> All right, Matthew Carr at Matthew WC seven six seven three. Chances of Adam staying on the roster, even though OKC is so far over the cap, and we got to try to keep PG and Mello. Uh, Clay Bennett is willing to write the checks now, um, unless there's a deal out there to basically turn Stephen Adams into another name, a better name. Uh, I see Stephen Adams as not necessarily a cornerstone of this franchise for the next few years, but one of the names that when you think of the Oklahoma City Thunder, you think Russell Westbrook, if if they're lucky, Paul George, Kamau Anthony, and then Steven Adams. I think that I think he's very much a part of this core. Yeah, I, I think about uh when within that one game where, you know, he was everywhere defensively. And he, he came out the perimeter and he knocked the ball away and then he got back to challenge a shot at the rim. Uh, that kind of stuff is exactly what you need from your center when you got guys like Russell Westbrook, Paul George, and Carmelo Anthony. And if he can, at that animal on defense, do everything, like, sure, he, is he overpaid? Yeah, he is overpaid. Um, but you're already paying it, and you, I heard the luxury tax be up to almost $140 million. You're not going to just give up Steven Adams. You know, you're not going to do a salary dump to get rid of him. No way possible you do that when 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 you're 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 playing and you're probably just as close as anybody else outside of Golden State to a championship, you know. So yeah, he's he's staying. I don't see him really going anywhere. When you say like somebody better, I can't think of a better fit. And you know, for that money, I mean, what are you going to do? Get boogie? You know? <laughs> no, you probably you're not going to get boogie because you know the, the Pelicans don't want to take that money for that long for another center. You know what I mean? They already got freaking. Uh, what's the guy's name? The Russian guy. Uh, whatever they got, they got a couple of big. Moscow. They're paying like, no, the Pelicans. They got uh, oh. not, uh whatever his name is. Yeah, I, damn I, it. This is this is good radio. <laughs> um, they got. They, I think they already got like, I want to say almost like twenty or thirty million dollars a year wrapped up in centers that you know they don't even really want to play now because they got boogie. So that sucks. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I, I can't really see you know any deal where he's going to be moved. He's overpaid, and he just has to play well, man. I mean, exactly. Um, you know, we, we say that like, what are we going? What are they going to do? Bring in Boogie? Uh, but I'm pretty sure there were some podcasts about a year ago saying about the Thunder. What are they going to do? Bring in Carmelo Anthony? <laughs> Who knows with Sam that- Presti? I would hope. So that's a good thought experience. I know we get, we got to you know you're you kind of wrapping things up, but like. Would you want Boogie on this team for Steven Adams? Mm. Would you want to pay? And, 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 you, and think about it, you get it because Boogie's up for he's a free agent next summer, so you're going to have to end up paying him like thirty million dollars for yeah. Or, you know. Yeah, so. uh, I mean before before Carmelo Anthony was part of the team, if I had a dream scenario with the Thunder, it was you know obviously Russell signs his, his extension. If you're able to have a lot of success this year and keep Paul George. 
the next big name that you go after either through trade or just wait until he's a free agent is Anthony Davis. Because, I mean, there were some revelings out there that, you know, Russ and Anthony Davis are really good friends. They, they share the same agent. They go a little ways back since AD's been in the league. There were some revelings that they might join forces with the Lakers. But now if Russell signs with the Thunder and basically Anthony Davis just continues to rot in New Orleans, maybe there's more of a, like, I want to win. And if, you know, my boy Russ is playing with the Thunder and having a lot of success and they need a guy that can stretch the floor at the five, that'd be the, that'd be the most perfect fit because – I think Anthony Davis is the best well-equipped five or, four, I mean, power forward, whatever position you basically put him at, to play against Golden State just simply because he can stretch the floor. And in that playoff series they had a few years ago against the Warriors, I mean, the the, the Pelicans got, they, they got rolled, but, I mean, AD had his, he had, he showed a lot, I mean, to me against the Warriors. Uh yeah he did and he'd be a great fit man but I just you know with that con they got him under contract for like three or four more years I I just don't see he'd have to really make a stink to get moved you know what I mean yeah well the, the other the other reasoning being like his injury concerns and his injury problems he's always hurt maybe New Orleans would just get tired of it and just be willing to basically give them a Sam Presti trade where the Thunder give up <laughs> uh, Alex Abrines a washing machine. And a second round pick for Anthony Davis. <laughs> yeah, I just I, I I I would be very very shocked if that ever happens, and I feel sad because he might be this generation Kevin Garnett, right? Stuck with a team that's just kind of trying to cobble together some nonsense instead of build a real team around him. And I, I don't know, we'll see, man. I, I actually I, I'm interested to see how the Pelicans do this year. I hope they do well. They'll rue they the do day well and they keep. They'll rue the day that they traded Buddy Heald. <laughs> You don't mean that, do you? Boomer, boomer sooner, man. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, maybe. He, he'll be a nice player, but yeah. No, yeah, he's pretty <laughs> good. But, I mean, when hey, again, this is, they put themselves in position. you got to start like Anthony Davis. You can't give him a second year undersized two guard to be his, his running mate. They oh, went out, They did the best they could, and they, they got DMC. So. I, I'd, I'd have pulled the trigger, too. <laughs> got to, yeah. All right, James. Well, man, we kind of covered a lot of ground today, and um, we're we're not even past the Thunder's first preseason game. Uh, are you going to be able to watch tomorrow night's game against the Rockets? Hell yeah, like it. I'm not going to be going to that game. I uh, will be probably covering the game from home on Twitter. Whatever, whatever I'm doing, you can count. I'll be able to watch it. I'm excited. Um, again, if you guys haven't heard, Russell's not going to be able to play. Patrick Patterson or Alex Abrinas will also not be able to play. So uh, Raymond Felton will be starting at the point guard position. By the way, thank you for retweeting that because I got a whole bunch of – and this this always kills me. Raymond Felton will be starting um, starting point guard tomorrow, and then a lot of people are just like, oh, my God, like, what? what? It's like, guys, it's the first preseason game. It's going to be okay. <laughs> and, I mean, it's been announced already that Russ had that PRP injection, and he's just chilling right now. I mean, like, everybody relax. Yeah, I, I mean – I mean, I don't know if, if the stream was showing uh, the pregame drills that the team was running through before the, the game actually started, but Russ was running drills with um, with the, the ones, and lo- he looked completely fine. I, I just see it as just a precautionary type deal. It's like we don't really need you to go out there and play some meaningless preseason games, some training camps. You know, just wait till you're 100%. I, I fully expect I'm- them to be ready game one. I'm wondering if the same thing's going on with Kawhi Leonard, and this is based on just nothing but my gut, and not even my gut. Just I'm I'm hoping, because uh, I don't know if everybody knows, if you guys listen, know that yeah, Kawhi is out for the preseason as of right now because yeah. of, of a quad a quad issue he's been dealing with since like last season, like right. You know, I think it said for a while he's been dealing with it for a while, and I believe he's had quad issues before that kept him out of game. So that's kind of like not concerning, concerning, but you know I'm, I'm hoping it's just more. Coach, you know, Pop is just like, eh. I just want, I want to, I want to, I want to retain, you know, your you 100 percent for the season. So we're gonna just kind of sit you down. You're probably right because now Pop can't sit Kawhi Leonard down for the games against Golden State, against Oklahoma City, against Cleveland. So <laughs> he's gonna have to just wait until he gets 100 percent healthy and just be safe with him. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, James, thank you so much for jumping on the show once again. Um, I'm gonna be barking up, you know, your DMs all throughout the season trying to get you to come on you know a handful of times so hopefully uh we can do this a lot more frequently in the future 
Hell yeah, man. I, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I feel I'm gonna give myself a C minus. I don't feel like I brought the energy today. No, I didn't really bring it. It's it's Monday night. You know. It's Yeah, screw I'm, that. I'm watching NBA basketball. I should be I should be, you know, dipping in and and, and doing cartwheels on the mic, but yeah, my Sh- bad. Shimmy Ojale kinda woke me up. I I'm I'm glad to see him out there getting getting some burn with the with the Celtics. I'm really I mean, I'm still high on him from uh the off season, uh, he's the guy I wanted the Thunder to draft. Even though, I mean, Terrence Ferguson actually he looked like he kind of belonged on. Um, he did look scrimmage. all right. I, yeah. I was shocked how how he looked okay. He's got um, he's got a really nice shot. He's got a really nice stroke to his shot. Um, I don't really know how well it's going to translate to an in game, but he basically looked like a guy that just by watching him play with the ones, he looked like he belonged. And I wouldn't be shocked if he got some meaningful minutes throughout the season. And I mean, the Thunder can kind of afford to basically experiment with you know whatever young player that they want to bring up because they're so talented on the top end. Yeah, man. Um, we'll see. Uh, like it's a, it's a preseason game and sure he looked okay, but when the games count, everything's a lot different. Right. So, yeah. And that's, going but yeah, I, I was, I was surprised too. I heard he was gonna be a big project and blah, blah, but he actually looked all right. All right, James. Well, I'll let you get out of here. Um, go do whatever the hell else you want to do, or uh, <laughs> fight, fight some battles with some Chris Paul fans on Twitter, or whatever. <laughs> whatever, dude. I, I can't. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll do a whole other show on the Rockets if you want. We'll do a. I don't know. No, nah, they're gonna be. I can't even talk crap. They're gonna be good. Whatever. They're gonna be good. They're they're coached by Mark D'Antoni. They've got James Harden. They've got Chris Paul. They're gonna win fifty five plus games and then flame out in the playoffs. Just that's that's what Mark D'Antoni does. I wonder how salty are they that they they swore they had Carmelo Anthony and oh he goes to Oklahoma God. City. Houston Twitter was I mean I'm sorry. I'll let you get out of here pretty quick. But Houston Twitter was glorious the day the Thunder got Carmelo Anthony. I mean, I I like everybody else, I was completely shocked, but man, they were the the salt level was dead sea level high. It was so funny. They I mean, someone brought up that tweet about Oh, the Rockets were completely confident they'll have Paul George and Carmelo Anthony by the end of the week, and that was you know back in July, and now we're here. <laughs> That's awesome. They, I'll say this, man. I don't normally, I don't beef with them. They're all right. I don't have no problems with them, but they are, they've been kind of insufferable. Rockets Twitter has turned to they've, they've been kind of jerks for a team that hasn't really won anything. Yeah, and you know they kind of kept taking L's to Oklahoma City and Russell Westbrook ever since the playoffs started. I mean, even before the playoffs started last year, it was just you know who's going to win the MVP? Is it Russ? Is it Harden? And they obviously wanted Harden. Um, a lot of national media wanted Harden until the end of the year when they all kind of went on the Russ train. Uh, the Rockets obviously bounced the Thunder out in five really quickly, but ever since then it's just been Russell won the MVP. Um, the Thunder got Paul George. The Thunder got Carmelo Anthony. The Thunder have kind of taken a lot of people and what in some people's minds the second or the third seed above Houston. So they've been kind of a forgotten team even though they added Chris Paul to their roster, but it's going to be fun to see it all play out, man. It's going to this is going to be a great year just like how last year was surprisingly fun to watch considering everybody wrote off the regular season. Oh, it's, yeah, this is going to be insane, dude. I've yeah. never seen so much player movement. I've never seen teams so restructured. So I don't care even though we know Golden State's going to be in the finals and they're probably going to win it. You know, I think we all know that kind of. I, it's still gonna be a lot of fun to watch the path to get there. Yeah, you, yeah, your Boston Celtics in Cleveland. Enjoy your little cakewalk out east. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to. I, that's that, that's what I'm. What's what's the biggest matchup you're looking forward to? Before we go, uh, out in the Eastern Conference. Both. You're just in the league. Okay. And this well, is not 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 just playoffs. Just like like one game or one series of games that you're thinking. I can't wait till these two teams play. Well. Eastern Conference. I'm going to say the Bucks because I want to see I want to see Giannis Giannis Antetokounmpo's development. I want to see if he's able to take that next step into the player that a lot of us just assume he's going to be. I really want to see if he's worked on his outside shooting. If he's able to do that, that guy's going to be a, an effing stud just for the next ten years. He, he'll probably be. You know, I've kind of had a thought about him and Chris Porzingis starting the next big super team at some point in their careers. That'd be really fun to see. Um, so basically, I would probably say Boston Bucks or Cavs Bucks. That kind of excites me. I mean, the Wizards, they don't really fright me in, in any way. The, the same thing with the um, the Raptors. They're they're nice teams, but I don't really expect them to do that much in the postseason. But out west, I mean, dude, it's a gauntlet. Every game's fun. I mean, you get you get down to the teams that aren't going to be in the playoffs. You've got the Pelicans, and they've got Davis and Boogie, like we said. Um, Sacramento. 
actually has a nice little young core of talent that they can. Oh yeah, that, that they're they gonna can, be fun, man. Yeah, they're gonna be a fun team to watch. And yeah. you know, we we all know what the Lakers and that stupid Lonzo Ball, Lavar Ball <laughs> madness. Every game out west is gonna be fun. But again, it, it it's it's no shocker. Warriors Thunder. I think this has. I think this finally has a chance to be the seer, um, the rivalry that was supposed to happen if Kevin Durant stayed with the Thunder. It was supposed to be yeah. you know, Thunder Warriors for the next five to ten, five to eight years. But if the Thunder are able to make it work, I think this is going to be it, man. I think this is going to be Thunder Warriors must see television. It's going to be a lot more competitive. Last year was painful to watch. You know, it wasn't really competitive. So it had yeah. the drama. It, so, didn't yeah. ha- it didn't have the. It didn't have the substance. Exactly. It was a lot of a lot of you know, a lot of yelling and emotion at you know for an eighteen point blowout. Yeah, I wanted to see the Celtics uh Celtics Wizards this year. I think it's be a whole different ball game, man. I think I think uh and oh, obviously the Cavs do, right? That's gonna be the big measuring stick, but yeah, Celtics Wizards is what I'm looking forward to. Well, dude, NBA season, I'm looking forward to it, and I'm looking forward to reading some more of your stuff. Go ahead and plug yourself, James. Uh bballbreak.com. James Hollis, uh, Snotty Pippen, Snotty, Snotty Pippen, what the hell's wrong with me? Snotty Drippin on Twitter. It's, it's, <laughs> you know, take Scotty Pippen and change a couple letters. You got Snotty Drippin. And I'll, I also do a little something, something for uh, Real Ball Insiders and the Almighty Baller Podcast Network, my man Chris Axman. You got anything coming out pretty soon that we can look forward to reading? Yeah, b Breakdown, we're doing our, uh, our our version of the top 50. Uh, I got some of, some of that. For that and I'm doing something on the Nets for uh, Real Ball Insiders and something for the Knicks for B-Ball Breakdown too. Oh, so bless, I your to bless your heart. Bless your heart. Hey man, I, I'm actually I, it, it feels different. I'm not. I'm not. So you yeah, just keep your eyes out for it. Well, I'm, I'm sure Thunder fans be interested to read some Knicks piece considering Canner is now at a New York Nick and Thunder fans are certainly still appreciative of the time Ennis Canner put in with the Thunder and he's going to be a guy that you know Thunder fans are going to keep um basically pay attention to for the next few years with the Knicks. So good luck to him. Uh, really quick before you go, uh, Brian Abbey just asked, and it kind of a good question for you, James, is this Thunder team comparable to the 08 Celtics before the season? Obviously the, the 08 Celtics won a championship. You can't compare them, but as it's constructed, does it, does it have a fair comparison to them? Um, The only, like this team is like Paul George and Russ are younger. Cause I think all of the Celtics were in their thirties, like 31, 32, 33 at the time. I think they were also more complimentary skill set wise, like all around kind of player, kind of like Paul George. But then it, it'd, it'd almost be more more like if uh, you got an older Clay Thompson instead of Melo, right? Because Ray was, even though he's an all around player, he fit in that mold of just kind of running around, catch and shoot. And then Kevin Garnett obviously was a big man. So their skill set, and they all were able to just kind of do their thing. While uh, this one's going to be a little like it's still complimentary, right? Melo's of a, a bigger kind of inside guy, you know, and he can post up. And Paul George's all around guy and rest the point guard. It's just a little different, right? It's it's not quite as these guys are a little more ball dominant, I think, than than Ray and and Kevin Garnett and Paul. But I can see the yeah, it's a big three. Um, and obviously, like you said, it's different because there was there, there was no Golden State for the Celtics to play. But I can see it. You know, a lot of good role players. Three really big, you know, big guns who can do really special things on the court. So three guys looking see, for their first ring as well. Yeah, three guys looking for their first ring, and you know, one guy got out of hell. Melo for for this time it's Melo. Back then it was KG. So yeah, I can see the comparison. I see the comparison. Well, James, I know you gave yourself a C or whatever, but I'm always going to give you an A. I always love talking basketball with you, man. I appreciate you jumping on the Peak and Roll podcast. A lot of fun, brother. We'll do it. We'll do it as often as you want. Hell yeah, man. Well, everybody, thank you so much for uh, all your awesome questions. If we didn't get to them, I'm sorry. Um, tweet deck was kind of annoying to me, and it would go really slow. So if we didn't get to read your questions, I'm really sorry. But we'll, you know, keep asking us questions, and if you annoy us enough, we will uh, read your questions on air. So I appreciate y'all, um, everybody. Thank you again for listening to the Peak and Roll podcast. Subscribe on iTunes, all that crap. Leave us a review. Tell me how much my voice sucks, and I will greatly appreciate that. But for Mr. James Hollis, this is Brady Trantham. Thunder up, everybody. And the Thunder win! How about that chicken salad out of chicken something else? We are the Stash Bros, and we approve this podcast.